Hey yo, we back and welcome to season two, episode one, part two. In part one, we talked about systematic training and um, Tyree Nichols will continue that conversation in part two. Um, we thank you so much for tuning in. Sit back, relax, and watch part two of the Flight Podcast. Here we go. How many black cops have killed white people in Highland Village? I'm willing to bet everything I own and will, will possibly own is that it's zero. Less than zero. Because it, it just doesn't happen. And I think that, you know, the, the community aspect is huge. And you don't want to feel like you have to build something like Wakanda and hide in plain sight just to be right. able to live and thrive. But that's almost what it's like. And, you know, I'm just thinking about that right now. Wow. Wakanda was hidden. Yeah. Yes. It was hidden from the rest of the world and it was all black. Wow. You know what? I'm not even going to go there today because that would literally create a whole nother. I just had a moment right Ooh, there. Write that down. We're going to make an episode on that. But yeah, uh, I can go real deep up in there with that whole topic. I do want to uh, bring a clarity point. Um, the, the gentleman that I was speaking on, his name was Tony McDade, mm. just to bring clarity. It was a transgender man who was shot and killed by the police in 2020. Mm. So, yeah, you don't have to be doing anything illegal to be targeted. And that's what I want people to understand. You can literally be killed for being black and minding your business. Yeah. It's that simple. And it just sucks when the hand, the law is the reason why you're targeted and killed. Police officers, ones who are supposed to protect and serve. And again, it's not just white people killing us from a cop perspective. It's policemen in general. And like I said, it's because we're talking about a system that was literally created and rooted in oppression and racism. Mm -hmm. And now that we live in a integrated community or an integrated world, you have black police officers, white police officers, Asians, Indians, whatever. You have all these different eth ethnic groups that are now a part of this force as a representation to say, hey, guys, we ain't racist no more. Mm. But your principles are still racist. Your practices are still racist. White people have a certain privilege that I don't have when dealing with the cops. They can run up on y'all. They can get in y'all's faces. They can say what they want to. And you're not going to call them aggressive. They not, you know, you're not throwing them, slamming them down to the ground like that. They're not being handled like that. Oh, yeah. You could shoot up a whole coliseum and walk out alive. Movie theater, um, church. nightclub, church, grocery store. Don't matter. Uh, they take you to Burger King, apparently. When yeah. you shoot black churches up, that's a new one. Takes a lot of energy. Um, yeah. So I just feel like with a lot of... I'm not going to say every department is like this. I'm not going to say every police officer is like this. But a lot of police departments and a lot of police officers absolutely are racist and absolutely are rooted in racism. Don't care how many people you got on your force that's a minority. Ultimately, you are still rooted in racist practices, racist tendencies. And the only way to deconstruct that is to reconstruct. You know what I'm thinking of something? I didn't hear that those police officers were... On leave, I think they just got charged, didn't they? Or didn't they just go straight to getting charged? I was about to say, I'm the, from what I read, they were all immediately fired. I don't, I don't remember really? reading anything about a leave, but let me let me go get some clarity really quick because I don't want to miss misinform. Yeah, um, because I mean, I remember seeing. I think who was that? Uh, mm, who was that in the uh, Northwest? Uh, George Floyd. George Floyd. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. Got you. So, yeah, I remember George Floyd, the cop who killed him. Didn't he get to go on leave or something like that? There was a whole bunch of instances where the cops weren't immediately fired. Oh, yeah. I mean, if we being honest, every incident, the the Chauvin dude, um, that's the the one that killed Eric Garner. Okay, yeah. Chauvin dude. Um, who else? Uh, the lady that killed the man in Oklahoma, I can't remember her name. Yeah. All of these people went on some form of leave first. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, if they did get terminated, they were terminated or reassigned or whatever the right. case. Yeah. But ultimately, they start 
with leave so that they can investigate, right? Yeah, they're still and once paid. they conclude their investigation or once they get to a certain point within the investigation, they determine the nature of your job. Mm-hmm. Now, some of them remained on leave. Others were formally fired. But I don't believe that anybody was immediately fired like this. Like, I mean, look how long it took the Breonna Taylor thing. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it took like two years. You know what? Before and they start charging people. Yeah, and that's another thing too. We don't really get to see these people in jail. No. We don't get to see them. And I'm starting to think like these people are like in these witness protection kind of environments to where they can actually still live a life. Because I have not, I have yet to see any stories about these cops that kill people that supposedly went to jail. I don't see them in orange jumpsuits. I don't, you know, we don't hear anything else about them. You know, so I'm starting to kind of think about that. Where are they? And I, I would like to see some proof that they're actually incarcerated. I would like to see that. <laughs> you know, I, I've had my theories with stuff like that, too, because I'm not going to lie to you guys. People would call me a, some form of conspiracy theorist or whatever. I don't really like titles, so I don't use them. But I do have ideas and thoughts that they tell us something. But something else is happening. So, for example, oh, yeah. not to say that this is the actual case, but let's just say the Derek Chauvin dude, the, the dude who killed Eric Garner. Let's just say he's the topic right now. And he was charged, excuse me, and he went to jail. We don't know that he's actually in a cell. Like, they could have gave him a ticket and gave him a new identity and sent him somewhere. Absolutely. 100%. We don't know. We are just... Hoping and assuming that justice is actually being served. Mm. And even if he is actually in jail, we don't know what kind of treatment he's getting. Oh, yeah. He could be in a nice cell with a TV and living the best life. Yep. You know what I mean? Taxpayers' dollars. We have no idea. We are very trusting in a government that has continuously lied to us. Oh, yeah. And I think that that's interesting within itself. It's like you have so much trust in a government who has literally lied to you about everything. Mm. You have so much trust that they are doing the right thing when they haven't even done the right thing by black people still in 2023. You know, that's, and that's a good point. I wanted it. This will be another episode because it, it's, it's so much to, un, to uncover and talk about how we as black people in this country still represent this country. We still go to the military. We still we still play in the Olympics. We still participate in all these things with a big flag on our chest and a target on our back. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. I think about that a lot. And again, I'm I'm, I'm me. So I, I, I be myself authentically in everything that I do. I don't stand for the Pledge of Allegiance or the flag because they don't I don't they don't represent what I stand for. Right. So people will be like, oh, you're in America. You need to stand up. It's like, well, no, I don't have to subscribe to that. That's a choice. You choose to stand up. You choose to put your hand over your heart and you choose to pledge. I'm not pledging with something I do not agree with. Mm-hmm. I'm not free here. There's no true freedom here for people that look like me. Mm-hmm. They're not fighting for my rights. You feel me? So I personally, I don't subscribe to certain things. So no, I'm not joining the military because they don't represent what I represent. Right. It's like I'm good enough to fight for you, but I'm good, not good enough for you to make sure y'all are not racially profiling me or make sure I have certain benefits or make sure, you know what I mean? Like you don't care about me. You care about what I can do for you. Right. What was that quote? Um, it's some quote I be hearing all the time in music. I can't remember who said it. So it's not what uh, your country, your can, country do can do for you. It's what you can do for your country. And it's like, I, I'm not doing anything for my country. No, because this country does not care about me. Because if it did, the things that happened to black and brown people would not be taking place still in 2023. You have people who say things like, oh, you know, that was long ago. Whatever, whatever. It's still happening. People are still racist. People are still rolling around, screaming racial slurs. People are on open forums saying and doing whatever they want to. Hell, they stormed the Capitol. They stormed the Capitol and y'all called that patriotism. But if a bunch of black people 
let's be for real. If a bunch of black people stormed the Capitol in the same manner, we would have got the shot. Body stacked up. We would have been shot, and it would have been justified mm-hmm. to them. Yep. So for me personally, I can't subscribe to certain things, and it's like people in America believe that black people owe them something when we don't subscribe to certain things. It's like, well, no. I know the history of my people and how we got here and some of us us that were already here. I already know what it is. So you're not going to make me subscribe to something that I don't agree with. And I mean, the police force is a, is a military branch. Wow. Yeah. So you got people, (laughs) this stuff runs so deep y'all. Y'all got to think about that. Now I wasn't in the military, but I know people who were, and I've heard about racist things that happen and take place in the military. Right. These people come to the regular world as civilians again, and then they join the police force Mm. and they come in high ranking because of, you know, their background. So you have a racist ass lieutenant now because he used to be a racist ass whatever on, you know, in the military. Mm. And now he's a high ranking officer and he's leading a flock of people. Half of them he don't like because they minorities, but because he has to play the American game, which is dealing with minorities he gonna make it appear like he like y'all or he's okay with y'all, but ultimately he hates you. Hmm. He likes what you can do, like protect and serve and fight, but he ain't checking for you. No, nah. he's so he's not looking for you for promotions. No, you know, we all we all see that as soon as as soon as you see a, a group of people going to lunch together and coming back together and laughing together and all this. He, <sighs> It's it's sad. It's sad as you can see uh, just those general actions and, and, and understand without even being told what's actually happening. Mm-hmm. And it's a universal language uh, of inclusion. If you're not included, then you, you're you left out. And so you have to find your own ways of inclusion. And then when we find ways of inclusion, then that's called gathering. Right. And, and, and that's looked upon as a threat. Yeah, I'm kind of glad you said that because that just made me think about how when we do things to celebrate ourselves and what we've accomplished, I'm just going to say it, white people feel the need to be included. And when they're not included, they say we're being racist. Now, let's get something straight. The actual definition of racism includes oppression. White people are not oppressed. Therefore, I cannot be racist. It is literally impossible based on the literal definition of racism. Mm-hmm. Now, can I be prejudiced? Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. But racist? No. I cannot be. And white people don't like to hear that. And I know some black people don't like to hear the fact that they can be prejudiced. But you can. Everybody it's it's has a thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that That's a thing. But I think it's funny because white people say, well, that's reverse racism. First of all, that's not a thing. There's no such thing as reverse racism. Not a thing. That is a way for white people to feel included again. Again, mm-hmm. you want to be oppressed so bad. Why? No, you don't. Trust me, you don't. You, but you think you do. Right. They like black, excuse my expression, they like black shit. Yeah. They don't like the consequences that come with black shit. When you do black shit, black shit happens to you. Yeah, everybody want to be one until it's time to be one. Until it's time to be one. And it's like, you want to be included so bad. Why? You already got You already got stuff. You I already got so much stuff. That's genetic. It has to be some sort of infiltration genetic. Oh, yeah, it's deep-rooted for sure. Yeah. That stuff is so deep-rooted. It's crazy to me. We can even talk about the Tulsa massacre. Mm. Literally. Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma, thriving in the early 1900s, thriving community with a bunch of black millionaires and billionaires who had private jets and banks and movie theaters and restaurants and retail shops and doctor's offices and all of these great things. This was all black owned and black operated. The Greenwood District was strict to Black people This was us Doing our thing Away from everybody else This was like Hey Y'all don't like us Cool We'll go over here And do it ourselves We'll build our own communities We'll build our own things We'll get our own money We don't need to mix and mingle With y'all to be successful Right The moment we started to do that They saw it And was like Oh no Ain't no way We finna let them be more successful than us They are not gonna include us In this wealth Burn all that shit down 
Yep. Yep. And then you had government in on it. That's the one part they don't want to talk about. The government was in on it. Yeah, this is you, this is war tactics on U.S. soil. Literally, they were dropping bombs out of the air, out of airplanes. You cannot tell me that in 1920, regular people could just get their hands on military bombs and airplanes and equipment and just drop it over a community and then dig mass graves and nobody go to jail. Mm. The police had to be on in on it. The government had to be in on it. And then on top of that, you're making postcards, posing with dead bodies, and you sending them in the fucking mail. Yeah. That is literally looked at by several government officials because we already know the post office, that's government workers. Those yep. are public service workers. Yep. So mind you, a postcard ain't in no envelope. It's just a picture just, yeah. with a little special note in your address. That's it. So I can see the postcard as I'm sorting mail. Nobody's bad in the eye at this. Nobody oh, no, cares. Were, the government, the America was proud of that. I remember there's literal picture proof of people posing by dead bodies, smiling. And you trying to tell me that the government not in on this? They were proud of it. This is crazy. We did something for ourselves just for them to tear it down. Why? Jealousy. They were not included. What a lot of people also don't know is white people were actually borrowing planes from the black airport in Greenwood. They needed us. That's crazy. That's the part they don't tell you. We were thriving too much, too much to the point where they probably were threatened. And they was like, yeah, mm -mm, go shut it down right now. Shut that shit down right now. Yep. So that's why we have things now like all these random massacres that nobody knows about. Lake Lanier, whole underground city of black people under a lake. Central Park in New York, thriving black community, now a whole park. Yep. They quietly wipe us away, loudly though. Yeah, very loudly. Let's be for real. I think that's the part that trips me out the most, like... It's not even done in the dark. It's done, and it's done in a big way. In in the same country that we represent, and that's I, I just don't understand it, how America is, is acting like, oh, this is so horrible. And then, like, like I said, they're proud of it. They're putting it on postcards. They're pouring water over it. You know, uh, it's, it's tough to deal with. And uh, it, in order for it to be turned... I mean, the not it, it it all started with us learning how to read. It, it's that's where never wanted these. They never wanted us to even learn how to read. And there was a reason for that, right? And now, and, and it, it got from reading in the eighteen hundreds, or let's say probably yeah, probably eighteens, yeah, probably late eighteen hundreds, to all of a sudden owning a bank and land and yep. planes. Yep. In the 1900s. We were showing them very fast. Oh, we were so fast. I mean, think about that. Like you said, most people did not know how to read. And the ones that did um, were far and few in between. As time progressed, as we got closer to the 1900s, more people were learning how to read. They looked like you and I. And they were taking what they knew and they were teaching other people that looked like you and I. Mm. Therefore, putting us in the place to be able to do something about our situation, like you said, i.e. making banks, creating all of these ways to make money. When you do that, when you do that, you now have power. They never wanted us to have power in any way. Nope. And the way to make us feel powerless is to create remain in control, system. right? Yeah. Remain in control. And the way to do that is to create a system. If you create a system saying, hey, you can't vote unless you can read, but you know damn well everybody that look like me probably can't read, your system going to work. Yeah. Also, if you if you invent something, now you got to go through the system to the patent office. Yep. And then we're just going to act like, oh, uh, nah, somebody already did that. And then <laughs> after you already did that, somebody else did it that. Actually does it. Take your idea, run with it. Now they get all the accolades and you just look like the dummy. And if you tell people, oh, that was my idea first, they'll tell you that you're lying. Mm. They will tell you that that never happened. Yep. We are a threat to society and it sucks because we shouldn't be. The, the amount of intelligence that we have as people is insane. And I, I feel like the more we understand ourselves and what we're capable of, mm. the more power we get, right? 
Yeah. Because knowing is power. Mm-hmm. If you know something, you can do something. If you don't know nothing, you can't do nothing. So the more we educate ourselves, the more we put ourselves in position to win, in position to create, the harder they come for us, the harder they make it. It's like, oh, let's make that illegal. Mm-mm, they getting too good at it. Cut it off. Let's put a um, let's put some rules on it. Let's mm-mm. can't yeah. get too good at it. It's 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 gonna get re-regulated when you do. Man, and I'm I'm just, right now I'm just dumbfounded because. I mean, I remember when Black Panther first came out and black people were showing up to the theater in like dashikis and stuff like that. (laughs) In collard greens. Right. It was hilarious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But honestly, I'm just really thinking about it because number one, Wakanda was hidden. It was a hidden paradise. Okay. America wanted their weapons or wanted their materials to make weapons. This is basically the, the only reason America wanted anything to do with Wakanda because they had vibranium and they wanted to use it for weapons. That's an American concept, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm starting to think because, like I just said earlier, black people went from not being able to read to inventing things. Mm-hmm. This is innovation. And then we didn't have an infrastructure to really make those things count until Greenwood in areas uh, such as this. It blows my mind how we, as as a minimal with minimal resources, made these great things out of nothing. And then, who do we have to go to to get the pass to get Shark Tank? Right? Mm-hmm. Like, think about Shark Tank. You have a product, and I was just thinking about this on this massage chair tour bus. The person who created had the idea. It, it, it did well in Dallas and they tried to expand in Miami and stuff like that. Boom, boom. They had the money to start it, but they didn't have the money to keep it to going. It. The mm-hmm. demand. Mm-hmm. And that's how it works. You have the idea and the idea is worth a lot of money, mm-hmm. but you don't have enough money, money to power the, the idea. Yep. Who yep. has the money for the demand? Now they want a piece and they yep. own it. Yep. And now they've, they're generating income that they had nothing to do with. Mm hmm. That's so crazy. All because they are in the position where they have the revenue already. Yeah. So like you said something key a few minutes ago, you said they were not able to read and then they were creative or innovative. If we take it back even further, think about that. Before we were able to read, we were able to produce things. We're Mm. creating things. As we learn to read, we're able to create even more. Mm. So it's like, well, why would we allow them to learn how to read when we know that when we know that they going that's gonna make them create more. That's gonna make them smarter. That's gonna make them realize more that they can do. Right. Like they only know this little stuff they can do. Let's keep it there. Don't let them think that they can. If they pick up a book, they gonna mess around and find out they can do way more than they thought. Right. Because the more you know, the more you grow. The more you grow, the more you create. It's yep. a, it's a cycle. But like you said, we don't always have the. The revenue to back the idea. And what we do is we take our ideas to people that got the revenue and now they want a piece of the pie. It's like, hey, well, I helped you get on because you didn't have the money to make the idea work. So if it wasn't for my money, your idea would still just be an idea, which yep. sucks because it's like, well, if I had my own money, you wouldn't even be here to even get a piece of the pie. I would be getting 100 percent of the proceeds mm. if I was in a position where I already had my money. Now, let's be for real. And we're going to wrap this up real quick because we're we running out of time. But let's be for real. A lot of these white people and other minority groups, they had the money. Mm. And that's because generationally they've been able to create the wealth. So now they can just be like, oh, here's $10,000. Whereas our our demographic group, it's harder because mm. we don't have the funds. We got the ideas. We got the ideas and a lot of us got the plan, but we don't have the means. And so we have to outsource the people that don't look like us and the people that don't look like us. A lot of the times will take advantage of us because they know we don't know the business aspect. They know that we don't may not understand the monetary aspect and percentages and cuts and dividends. and stuff. They, we, they know we don't know this stuff. Mm-hmm. And so they play that to their advantage. Yep. Because there's another system on top of that system. In order to get into the business ownership system, you have to go through all these legal signings yep. and authorizations. Yep. And every time you go a level up, it's just somebody else that don't look like you. Yep. And that's why it's important that we 
put ourselves in positions to be in these positions. That way, when you outsource, you can run into somebody who looks like you. One of the reasons why we do networking and connecting, because we want to bridge you with people that look like you, that understand where you're coming from. That's crazy. How we get on fire at the end of the episode? This is exciting because there's more to come. Absolutely. Because I'm just thinking right now, you know, you know, we talked about Greenwood and that's great. Now, black people still have an ideas every day. Absolutely. I just told you about one right now with the, the massage bus tour. Absolutely. You know how we generate you know, our generate our wealth from the outside? How? Crowdfunding. Facts. <laughs> but see, that's the thing. A lot of people don't know about crowdfunding. Yeah. A lot of, like I just found out about crowdfunding like a year or two ago. Yeah. Like the kickstart stuff. I didn't know anything about that stuff. And black people have to be, you have to believe in other black people. Yep. This is a thing that that creates wealth. Crowdfunding, okay, let's say it don't even have to be a bank. It could just literally be a fund mm-hmm. where we invest into a black business and then structure it to pay its dividends equally, yes. fairly, yes. evenly. Mm-hmm. And so the the business can still prosper and everybody gets their money back and some. Mm-hmm. Okay, but this has to be inside the black community. It cannot, it cannot go anywhere else. Cannot go anywhere else because as soon as someone puts their nails in it, and this is how black businesses get given away because we created a lot of things, but then we don't own them because they give us, they flash the big check in front of your face. Mm-hmm. You created this thing and right now you're making 10000 a month. That's great. But I got $2 million here for you if you just want to sell it to me. Yep. And then we hear that and we, we're ready to sell, not realizing from a long term standpoint, this is how you create generational wealth. That company that you just sold for ten million dollars in ten years probably gonna be worth a hundred million. Absolutely. And now you just sold yourself short ninety mil, all because you saw that money and you took it and you ran. And I'm gonna say this last thing and we can go ahead and wrap it. There was a family who owned a beach in California that mm-hmm. they recently just got back. They owned this beach for years. The beast the beach was they got an offer to sell the beach and they end up ultimately selling it mm-hmm. for a couple mil. Mm-hmm. And people were like, you know, why would they do that? This could have created generational wealth. And I get it, but they didn't have the money to main, like we talked about, they didn't have the finances to maintain the beach. They didn't have the funding to maintain the area around the beach. And therefore for them from a generational wealth standpoint, they saw it as an opportunity to take some money, take that money and invest it elsewhere. They like, forget the beach. That's not our niche. And I understood that. But when you don't understand certain aspects, you shoot yourself in the foot. You leave a lot of money on the table. Now, granted, that beach might actually turn into a very profitable beach. Mm. But it's going to take some money to make some money, and they didn't have that. So a lot of people was mad at them for selling, but I understood. They sold it for, I think, like 10 mil. Wow. But yeah, um... Hey. Yeah, this is a funny podcast, man. This is an exciting time. And, you know, we started with one thing and it just kind of branches out. It always like does. That. Yeah. And so there's more to come, especially on these two topics right here, two or three topics. Uh, but, you know, for now, just keep your head up. You know, this is obviously a tough time. It's always been a tough time, but we can't let that make us, you know, shy away right. from where we're supposed to be and where we can be. Uh, so I would say just sit around and, and, and think about this. Think about crowdfunding, think, even in your own home, even in your own home. Absolutely. There's somebody with an idea right now and they just need your help. And yep. that's it. And we can all come together and make things and, and make it happen. Absolutely. So, hey, man, till next time, it's the Flight Podcast. I'm Dash in Dallas. This is T, me, see me. And we just going to holler at you next time. Yeah.